Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to the Married to Gaming podcast deep dive edition. Um, we're covering Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which Sam completed two days ago? Two days ago, yes. Well, not just Shadow of the Tomb Raider, but that, that entire like trilogy. Survivor, tri- Definitive Survivor trilogy, I think they call it. Mm, catchy. Yes, yeah, well. I think, <laughs> I think most people probably just think of it as the Tomb Raider reboot, right? Tomb Raider reboot, the kind of origin story of Lara yeah. Croft. That's Lara's origin story. story. Yeah. So uh, let's give a bit of an overview of your experience of the first game and why you like it. And then we'll kind of talk about our experience of playing through the second game kind of together. Well, firstly, I'm going to have a little confession to say that I never really played a Tomb Raider game before I played those reboots. And... Actually, I don't think I even watched the films. I think I caught a few. I think I caught a few things of them. I was always very aware of Tomb Raider being around, you know, being a gamer myself, and her being for a long time kind of the only sort of badass female character, you know, particularly that you get to play as in games. Um, but I just yeah. never got around to playing them. And then so when they brought out that reboot back in 2013, I was just like, right, now it is time. Let's yeah. let's 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 do some Tomb Raider. The original original ones. Um, I was this is a controversial take, but I was of an age when they came out. What was that like? Sort of fourteen, fifteen, maybe maybe a little bit younger for the first one. Um, and my cousins had them on the PS One. I well, had the first one anyway. And um, they're kind of garbage by today's standards. Graphics are terrible. <laughs> Controls like she's kind of like doing this. There were some cool moments where you run around shooting wolves, and I think in the first one you can find a T Rex like deep in the earth. Um, but of course, they're not a patch on modern games. Um, a wonderful framework to build off of, um, if a little oddly shaped in the character design. The I think there are a lot of people around today that probably started Tomb Raider with the current ones anyway. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I mean, I think that was the whole point. Like, I mean, these days when you have those franchises that have been going for so long, they sort of have to have points that people, new people can come in at. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you come in and you're like, what is what is going on here? What is yeah. going on? So, like, you know, I think that was kind of starting. And I mean, they're actually the next Tomb Raiders that are coming out are remasters of the originals. So remasters are always kind of like, on the one hand, nostalgic for the people who used to play them. On the other hand, an opportunity for new people to play them and don't have to put up with terrible graphics. <laughs> so let's focus on... Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the one that we just finished. For for you as an experienced gamer and someone who loves those kind of stealthy, sneaky bow and arrow adventure stories, what were the things that really stood out to you uh, just as a player? Oh, okay, so I mean, I loved these games. Like, I loved them. I remember when I played the first one and I literally told all my friends, you need to play this game. All of my female gamer friends, I was like, this is a really good, badass female character and it's not all about her looks. She does some really capable things. It's so good. I was I was hyped up on it. So, like, and I loved, loved the second one and I loved, I loved the third one as well. Um, but, yeah, it was funny. I think I told you that I did say, although you can get shotguns and and handguns and assault rifles i'd always stick to the bow and arrow um yeah you really it's, did it's yeah because it's got um there's definitely an element of you know the the combat in it is relatively simple but and you can go in all guns blazing or you can sneak it and i always like to sneak it and then of course the bow and arrow is silent whereas if you start shooting a gun obviously everyone is alerted to your presence understandably yeah um so i think my my first, I'll tell you what, my first impression of a lot of the combat was Lara herself, the way she moves and mm-hmm. throws herself around the battlefield. And that was one of my favourite things in the first game, in the second game, in the third game. You know, she's not that elegant. She just kind of goes Wah! right in there. And she's not, the fact that she's not built, she's not this big, hulking, muscled kind of protagonist. She's yeah. quite small. And so, you know, you can kind of see the designers really kind of have, when she kind of like stabs people in the back, she throws her whole body into it. She doesn't mm-hmm. just go, yeah. boom. You know, she really gets in there, you know, like, and it kind of, and that, I think that was, I think that's one of the things that appealed to me in the first game was just kind of seeing how they, they've obviously, someone there has gone, okay, this is, this is a smaller person. How are they going to be able to do brutal things like killing someone? 
Mm-hmm. And I just yeah. kind of that that was something I really appreciated because I'm quite a small person. Um, so of course, when I see giant characters like Master Chief doing stuff, I'm like, good for him. I could never do that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was, it's interesting that you uh, you kind of highlight that because Lara is designed to be quite small. I think she's probably about five foot four, five foot six, but her body shape in the in the newest game is much more realistic. Obviously, she's still beautiful. She's still got like a, the perfect figure and all of that stuff. But if you look at just basic things like something I highlighted to you at the time, like the thickness of her waist, like she's got a thicker waist and a strong core. And like even around her shoulders and stuff, she's done in a lot more a lot more muscularly than a lot of female protagonists are often made. But she does have there are limitations on the size of her body, and I wonder if the stunt coordinators and the performance capture uh, team and everything they clearly worked with a performer or a series of performers. Um, there would have been the actor who played Lara who. <laughs> I haven't researched who that is. Probably somebody that we've heard of. Um, and then the stunt team doing the various different types of stunts. And there would have been, I'm sure, that a dialogue, um, a choreography dialogue about how she moves, why she moves a certain way. And then hopefully feedback from the stunt performer on, well, no, Lara wouldn't be able to do this because I can't do this. So we have to do it. Like you said, with her launching herself full bodily and then bringing her whole weight down as she stabs that weird shank yeah. into someone's into someone's neck and all that kind of stuff. Um, if they'd had a big male protagonist or even just a big female protagonist somebody with huge great big arms they wouldn't have had to have done that they could have gone up and just gone thunk so I think those kinds of considerations they certainly help build immersion yes I thought so some of the elements in it were like you know covering yourself in mud like to uh, to kind of increase your visibility, which to be fair, I was always like, yeah, all right, no, you haven't done your face though. <laughs> like, you know, so there's this big white face against like a kind of like muddy background that apparently no one's seeing. But that sort of thing aside, um, I kind of also liked that, you know, she just kind of, yeah, she just throws, like the character just throws herself into these environments. And yeah. also like when you kind of, when you jump down an enemy, so like in Assassin's Creed, when you jump down and like, what? assassinate an enemy you just kind of roll into this you just roll into this perfectly choreographed standing up pose as if it were ain't no big thing but when lara jumps down she she falls she falls on the person she takes him down with her and she usually then like rolls around on the floor like you know she's just literally gone and jumped in you know and they obviously yeah like you said they had them they had the stunt they had the stunt people and the motion capture people like actually kind of like do this and kind of were like right just do this like a normal person would rather than um obviously Lara's not completely normal she can like climb up the underside of a mountain like it's no big deal but (laughs) that stuff aside um she is yeah she is kind of just a a in desperate individual trying to like get through this situation I think um yeah toning down the superhuman aspect of a character like that really works obviously all video game characters are superhuman because if you tried to get them to do the things that they do for a lot of people just running for 15 minutes wears them out so climbing up the underside of a mountain and then doing a load of rolls and then assassinating 20 people and then handling a machine gun is that would just wear you out you'd need a rest for a whole day but um you know she is of course she's a superhero just like everyone but um if you took out each isolated moment, such as her climbing up underneath a rock face, or even just climbing up a rock face, or doing those sideways jumps, um, they do a good job of having her go, oh, oh, ah, oh, at yeah, the end she of everything. Doing and, that a lot. <laughs> and kind of react uh, realistically. And when she comes up for air, when her air is running out, and she comes up into a pocket of probably heavily polluted air yes. or stagnant air. She's not just like, ah. Oh. She's like, <gasps> yeah. And she doesn't go. It isn't. She doesn't just go up and go. And go she, you know, she actually <laughs> gasps. And um, one thing I, one thing I actually appreciated, which is probably not like, uh, I don't know how standard it is for a, a kind of a male watcher or viewer of, of of this Tomb Raider game. I liked how, although she's still a very sexually attractive character in the game, she's done to be beautiful and all that stuff. They've really toned down the sexualization of things. And you made an interesting point when. I made a joke and you kind of caught me um, and schooled me oh. on it. I, I wanted to talk about that. So it was the water coming up out of the water when she breathes for air, she goes <gasps> like that. It's a very feminine sound, a very feminine gasp. And I made a joke, which was quite sexist of me, really. Where I was like, oh, they always make um, female characters sound like they're about to have an orgasm. And you said to yeah. me, 
Well, you, you can explain it. You, you explain oh, yeah. to me. And I, said, and I said, don't be mean to Lara. It's not her fault that women's noises have been sexualized over the years. Because I said about how I've been on roller coasters and I've made all kinds of noise going, ah, 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 and been like, God, I sound dodgy. But then I thought, no, no, that's just, that's just the noises women and girls make sometimes when you're you know, in those situations. Like it's, and they've been, and they've been over-sexualized in the media. Absolutely. And I, I completely saw what you meant. And I, I I said at the time, I was like, oh, you got me there. Like you, you caught me out there. And I've had to revise, it's fundamentally shift my understanding of quite a lot of things just from that one conversation where, yeah, you pointed out um, most female noises in video games, movies and TV shows, the natural noises that you make have been sexualized for a male audience. So we just hear those noises and go, oh, they're trying to be, they're trying to make us sound sexy. But actually, that's just the normal noises that women make. I have also been punched in the gut and gone, Bleh! which probably isn't <laughs> very sexy noises. But, you know, but but there are other times where, yeah, I've been gone, ah, <laughs> yeah. like that. And it's, a, yeah, so. Um... I wanted to rewind back slightly to you, since we're talking about the difficult stuff uh, and the controversial stuff, um, the scene where she covers herself in mud. Now, I would love yes. to have been a fly on the wall it, it, with the writing team or the design team or whatever when they were looking at that. And they were like, OK, here's a model. Here's a 3D model of Lara covered in mud, including her face. Right. She's a white woman of privilege as well, which is a whole other aspect of it. A white woman in media in modern times, completely covering her face up with mud. And it looks like blackface. Right. And I, oh, can't, yeah. help, I can't help but wonder if they flip-flopped on that a few times and went well no 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 she's in the she's in the jungle she's covering herself up with mud she would cover her face up and then someone else is like no no no, you, someone's not going to like that you're going to offend some people because it's blackface even if you don't mean it to be and then the PR team were like we don't really want to have that discussion we don't want to, you know all of those kinds of discussions probably led to them changing their minds a few times and then maybe even deciding how much of the face to cover how much of the face to not cover how dark how light and in the end i think that's probably why they left her face here totally white um, i had not considered that at all <laughs> i literally was going oh, all right they haven't covered her face so that you can still see that she's lara and she's pretty um but i had not even thought about that yeah um it was i mean it was just a it, my mind was just wandering on it really because there isn't really an answer we don't know the design team we haven't spoken to them um maybe one of them will see this and reach out and let us know uh, who, who knows if you're listening crystal dynamics we have questions <laughs> <laughs> but things like that are really important in the modern age because you do have um members of the population the global population who who are who are and have been very poorly represented in media by things like that and to to have those sensitivities rightly or wrongly whatever decision you make as long as you've considered it and come out with a a reason rather than just go oh it's yeah. fine don't worry about it i think that's really good if they did that they may have just been like you said they may have just said let's leave lara's face open. yeah maybe um so tell me about so we talked about the combat uh and we talked about the reasons why you like her sort of physical movement and that from a playing point of view just staying with the combat for the moment what were a couple of uh sort of set piece moments that jumped out at you that you really enjoyed as a player so with combat, um, so in the first game, there were quite a lot of quick time events to deal with combat. And uh, they changed that in the second game in Rise because a lot of people said that they didn't like that. And they actually listened to the to the fans and changed that a bit. Okay. Um, the combat, I I mean, com for me, combat in games, there's only one game that I love the combat in. And that's Hor the Horizon games, which we'll do another deep dive on. At another time. <laughs> okay, another PlayStation um, exclusive. I don't ever, there wasn't a huge amount of the combat that ever stood out to me um, in these games because they were they were quite Assassin's creed -y and I like quite like the Assassin's Creed stuff. So I remember when I first saw it, I was just like, yes, good, I like this, let's, let's do it. Um, actually, what did stand out for me, which is something that they tried hard to do, was like the kind of puzzle solving stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and um, so, like, you saw me with like the ropes. And things so like yes. when you shoot a rope and um and you attach ropes to things and you kind of look around for like where the ropes could be. Um, Lara's so infinite like supply of ropes. Yeah, yeah, uh, and as you said, all the ropes that have been in this on this civil, ancient civilization for uh, thousands and thousands of years have not degraded in the slightest. Really but well made we ropes. Yeah. So um, when you watched me play Shadow, because. I I was I was used to that combat already from the past few games. What did you think of the combat? 
Oh, so I really liked the stealth sequences because I personally am not a stealth player, although I'm getting better having played Spider-Man. That was really enjoyable. Um, but I liked uh, watching you creep from uh, bush to bush to bush and then wait for the... You do the scanning thing and you wait for the enemies to turn from red to yellow and that shows that they're safe to kill, even though people can see them and all that stuff. We're going to come to the gamification process in a minute. Um, but I really like the move that you get where you can kill someone, drag them into the bushes, and then you set up their body as a bomb. Oh, like a shrapnel yes. Bomb. And so you would like kill someone, put them in the bushes, set them up as a bomb, run away, hide, and there's a little beep beep. And then their mate comes over and inspects boom he's dead run up to him turn him into a bomb run yeah. back <laughs> yeah. it feels like you're kind of glitching the system in a way because it doesn't feel like it's really designed for that it's more supposed to be more fluid where you you learn the patterns and you move through all these yeah. sections i did feel like in in shadow that the um that the way the enemies behaved felt a bit more realistic to uh to like assassin's creed because uh, I've played lots of Assassin's Creed. I'm actually playing through Valhalla at the moment. We will do a deep dive on Assassin's Creed at some point too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I felt like the enemies were kind of more... You had to you had to do a lot of... And I pointed this out to you at the time. There was You had to do a lot more stuff. We just had to go for it and hope they didn't turn around. Like yeah. they didn't... The enemies, they probably, they didn't always have a set behavior they sort of had a set movement but you couldn't always tell like in assassin's creed it'll be kind of like ah when the guy goes like this he turns back around and then he turns around so you know when he's about to turn around but they didn't really yeah. do that in that one and i felt like playing through it it felt a lot more like i just had to chance it his back's to me right i've just got to go and try and kill that guy and hope he doesn't turn around and as yeah. you saw from the amount of times that i died and failed there were times when i would kill someone start dragging them into the bushes the guy would turn around and see and start shooting yeah. me. and then i just had to, the next time i was like right okay i better kill that guy the second the second that other one turns around because then i have enough time to drag him into the bushes and that's it yeah and um there was an immersion for that that felt more realistic in a way obviously there's only so much realism they can do in a game um but i did feel a lot more exposed um yeah. than i do in like say like assassin's creed um in assassin's creed once you're in a bush you're fine you, you, yeah you, you, they, you might as well be in a you might as well be in a house where no or one can a, see you or a pocket dimension somewhere yeah so yeah exactly the stealth, stealth mechanics in games so there's quite a lot of stuff to cover here in one in one big loop but um what it what it really boils down to i think is when you start to build a video game that looks so uh i don't like to use the term realistic because none of this stuff looks realistic and it's not yeah. designed to um a good word that i picked up when i was really young in my drama class in gcse drama was uh the word convincing it still looked uh, absolutely phenomenal and beautiful and stunning and rich but not necessarily real um but it's not necessarily about realism it's about how convincing it is and how much buy-in you've got as a viewer as a player um that creating these pseudo realistic very rich environments is often in contrast with the gamification of it so like the stealth mechanics the fact that five thousand ten thousand year old rope is hasn't rotted away <laughs> um a lot of the swimming stuff uh the behavior of some of the npcs like the um and the enemies the the ai in them and all of that stuff and actually in a way sometimes with a game it's better that it doesn't look quite as real we're experiencing this with mass effect right now we're replaying mass effect and those kind of xbox 360 ps3 era graphics to me look they're really enjoyable to me because they look so crisp and clean and they do look like com computer graphics. They don't look real at all. But because of that, um, I'm a lot more patient with a lot of the game processes. Now with the uh, Tomb Raider, we had a lot of times where we watched Lara with two ice two ice axes underneath uh, um, an over a rock overhang and she'll then jump sideways and then her axes just teleport to her belt and she grabs onto something with her hands. And because it's such a good game, you just kind of laugh at that stuff and go, ha, 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 it's fine. Um, were there any moments for you that uh, you f like that, that you felt really broke the immersion? Because I personally didn't. There were a lot of them, but I was just like, I'm, I'm with it. I'm with this game. I like this game. So I'm going to just laugh off all of the stuff like that. I think the struggle that like 
for example, the Tomb Raiders had is that they're working with the Tomb Raider legacy. Yeah. Where of course Lara was doing crazy stuff all the time and, and jumping and just and just like free climbing all the way up like uh, up these um up these mountains and stuff. So they had to put they had to put that in the new games so that it felt like the so that it felt like what Tomb Raider was. And but then of course you've got like the new graphics, so it kind of like means that some of your expectations were a bit all over the place in the game. So yeah. where the game looked very convincing, there were those times, yeah, when she's just now I'm sure she's a very she's clearly Lara as a character is a very skilled mountaineer. I think she's been up Everest and stuff, um, but it's very okay. clear that you know she's been doing all this mountain climbing all her life. And she's very good at it. However, when she's hanging off the underside with just a couple of, like you said, like um, axes, Ice axes, and she's just yeah. kind of going, uh, 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 I'm just kind of like. That looks very easy. <laughs> um, so there were quite a few times that I joked to you going, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> um, but only reason being, because these new games have such fancy graphics and aren't like pixelated as hell, you know, it kind of takes you out of it a little bit. But like you said, because the game is good, I was able to sort of just laugh it off and it not be a problem. If the yeah. game wasn't good, I'd probably be like, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> just, you know, like, so I actually feel like all those things considered, they struck a really good balance between Lara's abilities, making the game fun and making it this big adventure explorer game and having respect and nods to the original games. I think that I, I, I think that's a, uh... I think you summed it up really well. One thing uh, that just reminded me of thinking about like immersion and all of that, two things. I wanted to ask you in a moment. Uh, one is where, what was the moment you felt the most anxious about uh, like playing and watching? <laughs> um, talking about Lara's pre-existing abilities before her first expedition. And the second thing I wanted to ask you about was your uh, cinnamon, cinnamon? <laughs> cinema sins style counter that you wanted to do about how many times a key character would have contracted a disease or a parasite. Let's talk about oh, the anxiety. God. Let's talk about the anxiety thing first. I know why you bring that up because I was telling you on the most anxiety. There was a lot of things in that game. Now, there, there were certain aspects of that game that were very kind of like horror like. I would not yep. advise you to play that game if you have a fear of being trapped underwater in a cave. <laughs> Which is um, actually one of um, my phobias. Um, yes. I found it okay, though. It yes. was, it was, you it was were all right with that one. But there was, there's a lot of time you have to squeeze through um, these narrow crevices underwater. Um, and, uh, yeah, the first time I did it, I was going, <laughs> then by the time I was doing it, the... I remember when I was doing it the 25th time, I was like, yeah, yeah, all right, this is fine. Yeah, um, yeah. But, um, but yeah, so there's a lot of these very tense moments in the game. But the most tense part for me was when you go back in time and see Lara when she's a little girl and she's playing in her garden. Um, and she and she climbs up her mansion. And, like, see, now, all in, in the game, in all three games, when you climb up things, sometimes they fall apart oh, and she falls a little bit and catches something else. Uh, and that's fine because she's a grown woman, right? Yeah. But when she did this as a girl, as like a, she was about 12, she must have been about 12 or something. Um, I was playing this and I was just going, oh my God, this is so anxiety inducing because she's this little child climbing up. Like, you know, the first bit was fine, but then like she gets really far up, like five stories high. And I'm just like, oh my God, Laura, what are you doing? <laughs> like, I am not comfortable seeing this. Um, and then, like, that drain pipe nearly falls off and she has soft and I was just like... And when we finished the game and, you know, like we had, to, and, you know, like, and at this point, Lara had, her Lara had nearly drowned multiple times. She'd nearly been crushed a few times. She'd had to crawl through, she had to crawl through a pit of dead bodies, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, however, I was like, oh my God, the most anxiety inducing bit of that game was when she was a little girl climbing up that building because I was just like, mm, this is so uncomfortable. It was so, it was really uncomfortable. But I guess that's a good thing because that shows how immersive it is. And it also was showing how her character is this just she just is so driven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, thinking about that moment. So I am a parent and you are, by extension, uh, participating in and responsible for <laughs> yeah. my ki my children uh, as a parent or, or someone who has children in their life. Just 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 witnessing what she went through, what she goes through in that scene where she um uh, are we doing spoilers? I suppose we are. I'll put a spoiler yeah, spoilers. tag Yeah, spoilers. This game came out in yeah. 2018, so yeah, like yeah, I think okay. we are doing spoilers. Sorry, everyone. 
So yeah, so uh, we haven't really spoiled it too badly now, so we'll give you an opportunity, if you're listening to this and you haven't played it, uh, to pause our podcast and who knows, maybe never come back. I Um, feel like we've given enough information to convince people if they haven't played it to go play it by now, so now we can do the spoilers. (laughs) Okay, so so, uh, we'll come back to your cinema sins thing in a moment, but from from a story beat perspective, what I really loved about that scene is that I was there with Lara. Um, I thought that the character model of like an actual child, which is something that games get wrong so much, like the awkwardness of her movements and, and all of that stuff. Very often when you see children in a 3D game, it's just like an adult actor that they've performance captured and shrunk down. And it looks really, it's kind of uncanny and strange. Yeah. So it clearly is a child that they've animated well in the way that she moves and climbs. And um, just if you ever go climbing, or you do a job that involves climbing, that different people of different body weights climb very differently. You generally find that very heavy, stocky people tend to climb from the legs a lot. They they use their legs. Um, I used to work in a field where I climbed a lot. Watching a child climb, the way they animated her climbing was very much in keeping with how children and young people climb um, because they've just got... Their bodies are so much more efficient uh, in terms of just u- utilizing energy and blood flow and all of that stuff so they can move a lot more confidently but then of course they're afraid so they hesitate in places that longer larger people don't hesitate and she has to jump in places that adults wouldn't and all of that I thought that was great from a story perspective the section where she falls and then she lands and the doors open and she lands at the open doors to her house and then she goes in to kind of f- you learn about her father and all of that um was such a symbolic moment of her falling and failing and then you know the first steps of her life being represented by the door opening the way she's framed in that doorway is not, is like a, a compare and contrast moment from an essay to how she emerges from the swamp with the fire behind her as an adult later oh, on Oh, that seems wicked <laughs> because if you even just think about the visuals uh, when she's a child she starts up high she's got the world at her feet she's got everything she's climbed all the way to the top of her own mansion where she feels completely safe and she falls she hits the floor she gets injured um she is framed by this kind of safe man-made environment and she turns to go find her father because that's that's her idea of safety at the time um fast forward to the end of the game where she emerges from that swamp where she's just been shot and whipped and bitten and and all this stuff's happened to her she emerges from that swamp where she's blown up that like a factory or something isn't it and she's framed with the fire behind her holding the gun and just looks absolutely badass that's her coming up from the ground with no safe environment behind her the world is just opened up in fire that she's caused and now she's going to rather than going to seek safety she's going to cause damage and I loved how they span that. I just thought that was that encapsulated the entire story and the entire game for me was this small, capable, brave young girl actually transforms into the vision of herself by going through hell. Oh, it was great. <laughs> There's a well. I guess now is a really good point to talk about the story, and uh, I loved the story. I loved, absolutely loved it. I loved Lara's development as a character. I liked the approach that um, Crystal Dynamics uh, took in just creating these games in the first place of saying, right, Tomb Raider is about this woman who just goes off into the jungle and finds T-Rexes and artifacts with Wolves. all these fantasy things going on and just, yeah, whatever, that's the day in her life. She shoots them all down, deals with yeah. it, picks up the artifact, does whatever, does what she does with it. It's just a day in her life. And I love yeah. that they obviously someone just went, how does someone start doing that? And so that's why they made these games because, like, you know, the, the Shadow is the final one. It was a trilogy of how she started and... um after that is supposed to be then right so we've seen how she became that person and now she this is this is who she is kind of the the tomb raider is who she is um in in that's kind of when now we get game now we get the original tomb raiders like you know sort of yeah in a way um and um but now the game was obviously it was created by crystal dynamics it was produced it was like Produced and distributed by Square Enix. Um, Square Enix, I'm a huge fan of. I've always loved the Final Fantasy games because I loved the storytelling, and I know you're a big fan of the Final Fantasy yeah. games as well. Um, 
And so actually, I think for me, when the first Tomb Raider came out, when I saw Square Enix were involved, I was just like, sold. <laughs> you know, um, I think I even went out. I didn't I didn't know anything about I didn't you know, I didn't know what the game would be like. I went out and bought like the special edition version because I was just right, like, yeah. yeah, this is you know, I'm going to love this story. Because one of the big thing for me in games has always been the storytelling aspect. I, I love a good storytelling aspect. Um, and I felt like throughout the game, um, just her development just felt. They really did kind of, they were kind of, they were starting with this person who was just cool and chill with all this crazy stuff going on around them. And we knew that Lara Croft's background is she comes from a really, really, like her father's a lord, I think. Uh, so she comes from this really rich background of privilege. So how does someone go from that to this? And so they kind of knew they had to work with her becoming like a kind of almost maniac in like being okay with yep. going out and doing this stuff. Um, and she started from here. So they kind of looked at what her character traits must be. Because obviously, I mean, like I said, I'd never played the originals, but I can't imagine storytelling and character development were the most uh, things they considered in that game. Um, so I played the second one, um, and there is a bit of story in that, in that you can go around her mansion and that you get you get a picture of it. But um, it wasn't until the third one they really started telling a story, and I can't yeah. exactly remember what that all was. The first one though is just you just going in there, just going around trying to find cool stuff, shooting wolves. Um, back then, games weren't story storytelling devices. A lot of them weren't. They they kind of developed into that when they kind of found their feet. Um, yeah. But yeah, so and I can remember when the first one came out, right. And like I said, loved it. Absolutely adored it. I, I, there was so much I, I loved about it. Um, and I remember some of the criticisms were things like, uh, like people kind of saying how kind of like how much she was like screaming and freaking out over stuff. And I remember being like, this is supposed to be the first time she's ever done this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, in a storytelling capacity, it would be weird if she wasn't doing that. And yeah. I was kind of like, I or I would have criticised it if she wasn't doing that. Um so I know there was a bit. The f they make a really big deal in the in the first game of the first person she has to kill because the per they start strangling her and she realizes I need to murder this person and so she, she stabs them she murders them and then she's literally like sobbing she's like mm -hmm. freaking out yeah. like you know because she had to kill this person and I kind of felt like considering how many people Lara Croft kills <laughs> throughout not only that trilogy but all the other things they had to show that. They had to show that, that initial thing. And they had to yeah. show... And so that she didn't develop into a villain, they had to show that this was an emotional thing for her. I do remember there being a bit of criticism on kind of like, oh, she has a really emotional reaction to the first one. And then after that, she's just killing everyone left, right and centre. She's absolutely and I was fine, like, yeah. And I was like, to be fair, if she had to have a breakdown after every single person she killed, that would have been a really long, boring game. <laughs> and also, I mean, it, I mean, there are various, always these tenuous justifications that you can make for some for a video game character's behaviour. The main one, of course, is it's a video game character, and that's just what they have to make them yeah. do. Um, yes. But if you wanted to find one for Lara, it would be that um, she's clearly uh, got psychopathic tendencies. Clear, she does. right? It, and and that is part of her personality. The fact that she feels entitled to go to all these countries and nick their stuff, um, and get rich off it, which is kind of what her family did as well. Um, you know, all of that stuff is definitely part of the problem. At the end of Shadow, it sort of shows her kind of realizing that her role isn't to discover all the all the things all the mysteries it's actually to like protect them and if i were to kind of almost give a bit of criticism i'd say i'd have sort of preferred to see her kind of actually feeling entitled to going to find them like kind of being like i'm the only one that can do this um just because it's kind of like because that that would set up much more accurately how she was in the original games by making a protagonist that you can relate to as a goodie they've created a cognitive dissonance between the character of the original games and our lara as you, as i like to think of her in that our lara they give her as many moments as possible to be a hero and not just a thief um but then by the time she's an adult again the angelina jolie version of uh, lara oh, yeah just nicking stuff and occasionally helping people but like I mean, there's a lot of guys, mostly men, but there are some female soldiers, I think, in, in the game. But there are a lot of guys that just look like locals from the village that have been hired to be security. They're just wearing like a normal shirt and have got a gun 
and she just like brutally murders them instead of intimidates them away and that kind of thing and uh uh she's definitely not a goody she's yeah. maybe the goody of the so, story because the other people are worse but yeah yeah and i feel like they could have i think it would have been more powerful almost if they'd have kind of showed to be kind of like well look she is like 70 percent good <laughs> like she's mostly good she has good Duality. intentions but there is definitely like a entitlement that she's the one that should be doing this you know because and i think that would have been cleverer setup maybe yeah. they maybe that was discussed maybe they shied away from that because they didn't want the audience to dislike her um i think i think maybe if it was made now they might have been more okay with doing that i think i think the a lot of media companies gaming and stuff are starting to treat their audiences like they're more intelligent they, they, in a more audiences used way, to be yeah. treated a bit dumb and now kind of like they're kind of treating audiences a bit a bit better and kind of thinking okay no our audiences are capable of seeing these characters as, as yeah. shades of gray just like regular people are yeah i agree i think that uh they were they were kind of in a hole there or in a, between a rock and a hard place and they just made a decision yeah. to kind of split the difference a little bit in favor of her being a goodie well there is a nice moment where her companion jonah um, there's just been a tsunami and she's going on about herself she's like i have this i'm that blah, blah, blah. and jonah just find goes this, i need to do that yeah and jonah's like are you joking like we need to help these tsunami people we're here now we need to help them now um and i thought that was a really good moment because uh so often in the hero's journey the hero is all about the hero and the weight on their shoulders and, and they kind of ignore a lot of what's in front of them which is not what a hero should do at all and i found that quite interesting i want to just go now <laughs> talking about okay. the the journey, the hero's journey through the story. Something I mentioned earlier. How many times in the hero's journey do you think somebody got infected with a parasite, <laughs> or <laughs> or would have, uh, you know, suffered like some sort of like toxic shock syndrome or that kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. So um, <laughs> I feel as part of me that sometimes feels uniquely qualified to uh, talk about this stuff. One because I have a zoology degree and I've had a lot of. There's a lot of times I've had to uh, think about these sorts of things. Um, yeah. And two, I uh, I was actually in the army very briefly. Oh, yeah, that's true, <laughs> I did yeah. the officer training corps when I was at university. And uh, it by no means was like the real army, but um, we did do a lot of like training. We did do a lot of, uh, what's it called? What do we call it? Uh, like, Rolling like, around in dirt. Training. Yeah, 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 we did a lot of that. God, Jesus Christ, we did. Um, and um, I had the problem actually of having to like... Uh, do my face in um in uh what's it called um camo and i remember my uh the guy who was my platoon leader saying to me coming up to me and being like about us look um i know that you copied me when you did this but he was black and he was like you see i don't have to cover my ears because they're black <laughs> and he was like you do because they are bright white <laughs> <laughs> and i was just like all oh, right okay <laughs> but yeah so there's a lot of times that i see in those games and uh lara is just you know if, Lots, so many plane crashes that everyone's just fine in. How many TV shows have we seen lately where there's plane crashes and everyone's just, just fine? I mean, Fast I, I, loads. I think about a few years ago, 2017, at about five, ten, five to ten miles an hour, somebody rear-ended the back of my car, Ford Galaxy, not a, not a tank of a car, but certainly sturdy enough. They rear-ended it in a four-wheel drive, and I. Um, I got a bit of a uh, bit of whiplash. My my back hurt. Oh, my back was hurting for about six months after that. Like my neck was stiff, and you know, I, I, and I was having like nightmares. Another another vehicle accident. I ha uh, where I slid on some leaves. I remember I was having nightmares for quite a while about that, and so did my friend who was in the passenger seat. And it was just like these people are just walking out of plane crashes, and and vehicle crashes, and being shot at. Like not even being shot, which is they do also get, but like arrows through the shoulder and shot in the neck, and they're just like, oh, they just go, and then they're fine again. It's the like they just all the they got punched in the face, and that's it. So yeah, yeah e even being punched in the face, like, is unpleasant. I, I've been punched <laughs> in the face. I imagine more than you, and just that feeling in the nose or that kind of whoa feeling that you get, or or that can jar your neck as well quite heavily, and or it can like loosen a tooth. Yeah. All of those kinds of things. And you just think like when you've got photorealism with gratuitous violence and damage, it um, uh, it doesn't yes. take you out of it. It's just funny to, to think about. We shouted at the TV quite a bit, didn't we? Yeah. Um, but we clearly had a lot to say on the topic, hence why we're doing this podcast episode. Um, <laughs> I did like that yeah, they so... gave a nod, like Jonah gets a parasite up his arm. 
He does. He does. And he, that happened yeah. after I'd mentioned, I was kind of like, they're in the jungle. They're in the jungle. <laughs> and, um, you know, she's like jumping into the water and stuff. And I was like, right, yeah, that's it. You know, you've, you've got every disease now. Yeah. Like Especially all them cuts. parasites are just like, yeah, you has got, yeah, they've got cuts. They've walked out of a plane crash. You know, they've got cuts, they've got burns, they've got everything. And she's like in the water and she's like doing all this. And then, yeah, but yeah, Jonah does actually get a parasite that she has to pull out of his arm. And I was just like, ah, maybe the writers knew full well. And they were like, let's let's have someone have something happen. <laughs> um, oh, um, by the way, Jonah is a character. I think we hadn't actually explained who Jonah is. Um, he's right. actually a character who's in, um, he was in the first game on the, and uh, he's just kind of stayed with Lara throughout the, um, Throughout the second in this game as well, and he's gone yeah. on her. He's gone on these adventures with her to kind of try and help her. Um, I assume so. I assume it's so that the writers have someone for Lara to talk to, like so that you yeah. can establish her character and things like that. And it's, it's a moral compass as well. If you look at all of those kinds of adventure stories, like Indiana Jones, um, even the yeah. Mummy, Brendan Fraser movies, um, the Uncharted game series, um, less so I think with Horizon Zero Dawn and Aloy. Actually, she doesn't have she does have companions in the second one a little bit, but they don't they're, they're not as prevalent as in this one. But they are yeah someone for her to talk to, but also a moral compass, a way yes. for the character to reflect on their behaviour, which is often absolutely atrocious because they're just psychotically murdering people. Um, yes so how many times someone would have contracted parasites many times because also every (laughs) single time Lara laid in the mud to like cover herself up you know that's also like water probably there's waterborne pathogens in there so um Um, thanks I I really wanted to get your (laughs) perspective on that uh recorded because it's quite interesting now one of the really important things I think that uh, we should cover and I'm really looking forward to covering because um, part of the whole Married to Gaming thing is we like to talk about representation and um, a big issue in representation representation, sorry, in media is how women are represented and have been represented over time, how that's changing, how that's not changing enough or changing too far and all of that kind of stuff. So I'm going to say a little bit and then I want your opinion afterwards. So my experience as a man in in media and in um, gaming and stuff, especially with characters like Lara, but specifically Lara, is that you see a lot on sort of YouTube or I saw one on Facebook the other day. I see a lot of stuff where there are like mods for Lara where she looks, she's been hypersexualized. She's wearing like nothing. They've expanded the size of her boobs to be enormous. And um, she's, you know, going around in these caves with nothing on her feet, which is absolutely awful. Um, <laughs> and the kind of, um, there's also been, I haven't seen much of it, but a weird pushback against the new games because she looked a certain way in the old games and the new one doesn't look like her in that. And there's a lot of, I would say, quite anti-feminist stuff that kind of comes out of that dialogue um, and then bleeds over into some of the things that are actually very good about Lara as a character for women and for like young girls to, to look at. Obviously, she is very beautiful, just not the modded versions of Lara, but the just genuine version of how they've designed her. And they would have put a lot of consideration into how beautiful do we make Lara? How realistic? How strong? How weak? Um, you know, I said to you, I reckon there was probably a lot of meeting time just literally devoted to how much cleavage she should show when she comes up out of that hole and that kind of stuff. But the way you said that bled over was that the whole thing got criticised from a feminist feminist perspective, like the fact that you can get lots of cool outfits and that Lara Lara's character is able to wear all this great stuff and you can customise things and all of that. So that's just a big jumble of stuff that I kind of want to unpick with you from a, from a woman's perspective because your perspective is much more valuable than mine. So <laughs> what are your thoughts on Lara Croft, the Tomb Raider games, and then feminist concerns? How, do, how does that all match together for you? Well, obviously, having been into video games since I was able to be, which was probably about six years old, which was about 1995, um, I, you know, have been a woman in gaming and seen <laughs> kind of how it and seen like how it's uh, how it's evolved and how it's changed. Um, when I was young, obviously, I had to put up with unfortunately the fact that most games were made with the idea that they were going to be young boys playing them. Yeah. So like I wasn't always necessarily considered that didn't necess- that didn't always matter because some games were just made without like male gaze stuff going on. Um, well, like sometimes Spyro I just didn't... and Mario and yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Some things sometimes I just didn't notice. 
didn't notice at yeah. all because whatever. And then somebody would point out to me like 10 years later, be like, that was kind of a bit, uh, a bit bad for women. And I was like, oh yeah, never really noticed. You know, so there's a lot of that. I think it's very important now. It would be very easy to go on and on and on about the way women were portrayed on video games a while ago. Um, and it would be very easy, even for me to kind of, because there's a lot of, as you know, throughout our relationship, I've, I've talked about this topic. It would be very easy for me to go on about it and, com- and, and and complain massively about what it used to be like and what I used to have to put up with. But in the interest of moving forward, the way the Lara Croft Tomb Raider games were, that's never going to change. That's never going to change what they were. And there was certainly an aspect of it that was like, ah, this is a video game. Boys like video games. Let's put this female character in and give her massive boobs. Like, that'll appeal <laughs> to it. You know, there was def- that. Let's not shy away from the fact that there was clearly an aspect of that there. You know, um, she was, a, I think, one of the uh, female tropes is the bad at the, the fighting. Fight it. I don't really like the term. It's got a big swear word in it, even though I did use the swear word earlier in the podcast. But the fighting F toy, she's called. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think about yeah, yeah. Um, the Jumanji movie with The Rock and uh, Jack Black. The, the, the character that in that one. is called a, she's called a dance fighter. Like in the oh, Jumanji right. thing, okay, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's good. So it's like, funny, yeah. so yeah, Lara is kind of like one of those originally. However, that doesn't mean that we can't take the concepts of that and we turn, you know, uh, and 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 build something better out of it. And so I feel like you know uh, the Lara Croft video games are always going to have some kind of criticism from people who were still kind of upset about the way she was portrayed back then which is fine, uh-huh. uh, which is understandable. Some people are still a bit, you know, so there were some people out there who are still a bit hurt by by that. Um, so, you know, whereas Horizon Zero Dawn, as far as I'm aware, you know, brand new game series, so hasn't had much criticism over the yeah. fact that, like, you know, you've got Aloy, this female main character, whereas um, whereas the Lara Croft games have because of the legacy it's 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 um, coming from. Yeah, their heritage um, is of this sort of sexualised male gaze character. Yeah. Which I think um, they've done a good job of flipping the script on, really. Yeah. Um, However, she was very capable. Even as sexualized as she was, she was a very capable female character who you played as, and you didn't get that. So yes, she was sexualized, but she was also, you know, she didn't have a man coming in to save her all the time. You know, so that in itself, aside from the sexualized bits, that in itself was probably quite empowering for a lot of the girls who did play those games back in the day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so because of that, it, you know, I imagine even the makers, even the creators, were like, "We're going to be, we're going to be facing a lot of criticism. Whatever we do, if we don't make it just like it was in the old games, we're going to get had a go at. If we change it from what it was like in the old games, we're going to get had a go at." You know, yeah. yeah. And I think they did a pretty good job. Um, they've made Lara certainly has the superhero proportions. You know, oh, she's she very has, tall. Like, it's very long. Yeah. She's very tall. Uh, her, you know, like her actual waist is about this freaking long. You know, like 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 superhero proportions are. You know, I she's, think my waist is about this big. <laughs> she's elongated. Like, her proportions are elongated. However, she's actually also quite petite. Yeah, yeah. Which means that um, her waist is probably only about like twenty inches yeah. or something. But, yeah. but of course, superhero proportions—that's not a female character thing. Male characters have the superhero proportion things going on as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So she's clearly so she's clearly got that. Um, but you know, they you know like they made her boobs a really normal size, like. She looks like she probably wears a rather supportive bra, which one would have to if you're crawling around in the jungle. She's like rolling Fine. around. She does a lot of rolling, yeah. doesn't she? And, she does and, a lot yeah. of rolling, crawling around, you know, like so, you know, that, that makes sense. Um, so, you know, and, um, you know, when I was playing it, I, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, also her ass looks quite nice. But that is <laughs> just how a woman's body looks when she's got jeans on. Like that's just, that's just how, how it looks, you know. Like we were saying before with the noises, there are aspects to women just but just just you know just by standing there have been sexualized like it's just a woman standing there but the way her hips curve has been sexualized that's not her fault you know that's not you know that's 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 not you wouldn't be able to do a female character who is like slim and petite without looking like that so you know because so there were some criticisms of like oh she's still sexy and I'm kind of like well she's just i mean like yes she's pretty because most media cast their main character as an attractive person because like that's kind of like that's what people will pay money to go and look at yeah uh, to be honest these days though these days i think now of course this like game came out in 2018 but now you're getting a lot more 
uh, people who just look like normal people and mm -hmm. people are kind of responding to that well within a certain framework i'm always reminded of that episode of friends where joey is giving the acting lessons and joey's like and i'm spending my time teaching acting to people who are mostly too ugly to even be on tv <laughs> um so <laughs> so yeah and that's that's the thing about um her her look and everything is that she's athletically fit but realistically she would actually be a hell of a lot more hench if she was able to do all that upper body work uh, with the possibly climbing. Possibly, yes. But I mean, like, if there's one thing that I've kind of learned from kind of seeing, like, for example, things like Ninja Warrior, is oh, like yeah, some yeah. of the women who compete in that are actually, Katie Katanzara, she's my size. I'm yeah. five foot. <laughs> like, yeah. she's the same size as me. And she doesn't have huge shoulders or something. No, but then other true. women who compete in it do. So it very much depends on the individual and how they've trained and kind of what yeah. they, and, and what their genes are. So like, you know, and a lot of, the thing is, a lot of like big muscle comes from either training specifically to have big muscle. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah. it's a very testosterone-y thing to build large muscle, whereas women don't necessarily have a lot of testosterone. So that muscle growth doesn't happen. So that's why if you ever see like a woman bodybuilder, she usually just looks like a woman. Like Because a lot of people say, I don't want to, like they get a lot of women, I don't want to lift weights because I don't want to look like a man. Like, you know, and it's like, but you won't if you look at what a woman bodybuilder looks yeah, like who isn't like, like taking steroids woman, and all yeah. that sort of stuff. She just looks like a she just looks like a woman who's got very well cut muscles in their arms and stuff. Yeah. You know? So so Lara might there is a possibility that she could do all those physical things and still look. I mean, look at Bear Grylls. He climbs he's... mountains and stuff all the time yeah. and he's pretty wiry. Well, I mean, interestingly, like so when I used to be uh, a, a lighting rigger, um, a lot of my contemporaries were men in their 50s who were the only ones who kind of hadn't had a heart attack yet or whatever but they're very fat they drank a lot of beer and they were just really really strong guys and they just climbed um all day up and down 10 12 14 hours a day just climbing up going upside down just using hooks you know not no fall arrester no nothing and uh that you if to look at them you'd think oh this is a taxi driver you know this is somebody who sits down all day doing nothing but they they just they never trained for anything and they just uh i guess the belly was like a energy reserve or something uh i want to quickly pivot because we're going to be wrapping it up fairly soon uh and the last thing i would like to cover with you is uh quite a positive thing it's it's feminism related i think and it's something that the game you said that the game had come under fire for or games do in general and that is lara's selection of outfits not necessarily the ones going back in time, because you could play as the original Lara, which looked kind of weird, and, and the one from the Rise of the Tomb Raider game and all that, but just the outfits that you get integral to this game. They're so cool. And you really liked them. Yeah. And yeah, so, and you wanted to be allowed to like them in peace, you know? Yeah. So I was gonna go I was gonna go on to that bit. I, I yeah. do remember I think it was when I can't remember which of the three it was, but I remember when one of them was coming out, there was a big press conference uh where Crystal Dynamics and Square Enix were showing off kind of the Lara model and they were talking about all the outfits she could wear. I didn't think anything of this until I saw a lot of feminist criticism saying things like, oh of course you have a female led you have a female led game so therefore you're talking about her clothes. Um yeah. and I remember just being like, oh I really see anything wrong with that um you know i didn't see the problem i was kind of like i mean i can sort of guess i can see what you're saying but like i didn't, I didn't think it was a problem um yeah. and i kind of thought like well there's a few things to play here one male and female ga gamers alike like dressing their characters up in different clothing there's a Absolutely. lot of games that are male led where you can change your character's outfits and like male gamers will spend ages choosing them i'm sure you've done that i recently spent more money than I'm prepared to admit on camera on a special deal that allowed me to unlock all four Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles and their weapons and their back bling on Fortnite, which I play with my children. It it cost me more than a 42-year-old man should probably pay. Um, and, Love you know, how you I, put that qualifier in, that I play with my children. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, I like to get Michelangelo and put the correct back piece on and have the correct weapons. Um, and then I pick the glider that he uses and I pick the dances that he can do and all of that stuff. It's to entertain me and entertain my kids when I play with them and, and yeah. uh, members of my family and all of that stuff. Uh, and I'm absolutely unashamed to say that I like it. It's great fun dressing up my player as stuff I like seeing, stuff from my childhood and all of that. And I don't see why anyone should ever come under fire. 
yeah. for liking and, that stuff. And the other thing I kind of uh, wanted to talk about on that is um, that um, a lot of women like clothing and fashion, and that's okay. Like, that's fine. And they probably were trying to have this game appeal to female players. So they put a lot of effort into kind of like the fashion and the clothing. And so I felt like the criticism was more actually a sort of internalised misogyny thing of thinking that women's interests are of less value than men's. And oh, okay, women's, yeah. you know, like feminine interests, like clothing and stuff. You know, um, you know, obviously they're not only women's interests, but like they're considered they're considered more feminine by society. And I just sort of felt a bit like, well, if they were talking about all the weapons she could have, they probably wouldn't right. have complained. But the weapons weapons are considered a more masculine sort of thing to be interested in. But talking about her outfits is kind of like, uh, you know, and I'm just like, but 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 a lot of women like that, and that's fine. And yeah. I said to you before, like the um, when Final Fantasy X two came out. Um, that game they changed that they that was the first game where you had like that game you had three female protagonists the main characters were three three women if you wanted to be like a magic caster or a, or uh, or using daggers or using guns or using a sword is you change their outfits and they had all these outfits I adored that I loved it I remember I got the I got the because. Back in the back in the nineties and the early two thousands, you could buy the strategy guides for games, big books, and I bought that book just so I could see all the outfits that they could all have because I thought they were wicked. And I just thought, um, actually, like you know, um, if women are going to be included in gaming, then we should have things that are traditionally feminine, that like and 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 see them as just as important as the things that are traditionally masculine. You know, yeah. so all the people who were saying, "Wow, oh, they're just making, they're just, they're just focusing on Lara's outfits." I'm just kind of like, "Yeah, so you wouldn't complain if they were focusing on Lara's guns." Yeah, exactly. Like, and her outfits are just as cool. Um, and uh, you know, well, we're talking about the weapons. The fact that she makes that knife out of a bit of steel from a uh, yeah, airplane wing at the beginning that. keeps it all the way till the end, and it doesn't break or anything. Is kind of cool. Um, yeah, and I think as well, like, if we're just on the subject of kind of feminism and positive representation, having a beautiful, capable, <laughs> well-dressed woman in a position of uh, not only kind of like physical strength and physical capability, but also uh, she is the authority in the story. She's the authority with the uh, people in the villages she meets. She's the authority with Jonah, who often defers to her. Um, she's the authority against the antagonist um, and the... Uh, uh, and the main kind of villain of the story she conducts herself with authority she contradicts people all the time she never um just goes oh you know and backs down she stands fast and she has arguments and she makes points and she tries to appeal to people and win them over and convince them that they're doing wrong and all of the things that traditionally you would see a male action hero do without question and then just go oh well never mind i'll just have to kill you then bang 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 uh for um for a, when i was a young man if i had played a game with a female character like that i think it would have very much gotten right into my head like media as a hypodermic needle kind of got into my mind and helped reform my picture of not just female player characters but also just women in the world you know that's a very strong computer games are a very strong way to send a message about how you should look at people how people are regarded and uh, what you think of them. Books are very good at that as well because they're so immersive in the same way. Um, and the more and more representations of women that are shown to be confident and capable, the more young men and young women will have their attitudes shifted towards that uh, more egalitarian viewpoint, which is really what we need from society as a whole, I think. Um, I think we've covered it. What do you reckon? Hmm. Anything else? I don't think there's anything else I cover? want to bring up about them. Um, I mean, as you can probably tell from this whole thing, I, I loved them. I do think if if um, if I had a friend who came to me and said, "Oh, my uh, daughter's interested in video games. What would you recommend me for something that she uh, she that is a good role model?" Aside from the fact that this game is probably eighteen plus because of all the yeah, crazy stuff, the I would definitely say, "Well, actually, the new the the Lara Croft reboot was is great because she just." She just figures everything out herself. Um, yeah. 
I think the main thing that I, you know, she she's like I said, she's very capable. Um, she doesn't she doesn't ever back down. She has a few moments of doubt, like within character, and then she's bolstered by her friends, kind of saying like, yeah. "No, you've got you carry on," you know, like um, but never in a way that there's never like a male friend that sort of takes over or something. Like you know, it's mm-hmm. the, the um, you know, um, I felt like yeah, like I think she's solidly got a really good spot. Like I feel like they did a very good job of taking this character that had a lot of um had a lot of although could be caught could be used as a female role model there would have been problematic stuff there if she was they've taken they've taken all the good bits that were good about that character taken them and added to this this the new lara and i think yeah. that she's uh, yeah and i feel i feel would feel very confident of kind of using that character as an example of like um positive female role models cool all right well uh thank you very much sam once again for joining me on the podcast um thank you too you are full of insight and uh, i absolutely love it well thanks very much everyone for listening this was a deep dive on shadow of the tomb raider with uh, samantha de matos um if you're interested in uh hearing or seeing more of us then consider subscribing um to the podcast you can do that where we are on uh, youtube or spotify if you want to come over to discord and have a chat with us um i've got a little community there called puck hq you'll find uh, a link to that in the description of this in the video format on youtube um so yeah thanks very much once again wherever you are in the world have a lovely uh, morning or afternoon or evening um, i've been adam Pucky, your host, and this has been Samantha Dematos. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>